Okay, so I'm going to speak about the testimony somewhat generically, just not to reveal who it is. But basically, um, my dad and I were dealing with a situation. So we have a family member, and this family member went to the hospital about a week and a half ago, and and it really it really looked bad. So this person went into the hospital because of heart and lung issues. There was an inability to walk, an inability to do any kind of exertion without just like extreme shortness of breath and and just inability to function bodily function properly to do to engage in any activity. And so so anyway, um, they ended up at the hospital Tuesday a week ago, a week and a half ago. And the diagnoses were not good. They said there's like, um, what is the word? Uh, emphysema in the lungs, COPD, um, incurable lung condition. They said um, congestive heart failure and, and all these things. And there was edema in the body, swelling, you know, fluid retention in the body. There was um, the lungs were filled with fluid. There was fluid around the lungs. And it was a grim situation. Then, you know, oxygen level would drop to like 60s or 70s, and it's supposed to be in the high 90s. You know, 100% is perfect. And, you know, when somebody's breathing correctly, with it should be like, you know, 97, 98, 99, 100, it should be way up there. And so upon exertion, it would drop down to like 60s or 70s, which is like basically insufficient oxygen to do anything. And so it was, it was really a problem. And so the... Another problem was um, afibrillation was occurring where the heart rate would zing from like 70 to like 220 down to 170 to, I mean, just like, da, 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 just up and down. Like it was just insane. And so during this um, week and a half time period, there were several points of time in there where when you're looking with your eyes, you're like, man, you know, your eyes are saying this person is going to die. You know, and, and that's a dangerous place to be in because if you believe what your eyes are telling you and especially if you're a family member and you're in that room constantly looking at them looking at the numbers on the on the sensors going crazy in a negative direction um, it's hard to believe you know it's it is a challenge to believe in healing when you're staring death in the face and, and <laughs> that's a problem and especially if it's somebody that you know and love because you're emotionally tied up in the situation and emotions are not your friend when it comes to a critical situation. Emotions are not your friend. Emotions want to pull you into fear, pull you into worry uh, and all these negative directions. Okay. So we want to be, we want to kind of like disengage emotionally from a situation. It's not that we're to be cold hearted, but that, you know, emotions will pull you out of faith and you have to be aware of that. That's why whenever there's, a situation in your own household, it's good to have somebody outside of the household that can help you if you need it because they're less tied up emotionally and they're more, they have, they'll have, they should have a greater ability to be steadfast in faith if you're having a problem. Now, I always recommend try and resolve your situations yourself first by your own faith because then you're going to grow more that way. But anyway, so um, our eyes were looking at death, the, you know, and it was getting really frustrating. So we would pray for this person and things would get better. And then all of a sudden, boom, they get worse. And then we pray again and it get better. And then boom, it get worse and then up and down and up and down. And it was exhausting. And, you know, it's really easy to, to kind of get the mindset. Well, I guess this is it. You know, I, I guess we should start thinking about, you know, then what's going to happen when this person dies and, and so those thoughts, they naturally come and we have to fight against them. And so then I remember something that Curry Blake had said, you know, so Curry Blake, he runs Dominion. Uh, what is it called? Uh, John G. Lake Ministries. And he has Dominion Life Church. And, and he's probably the greatest teacher on healing on this earth and probably has the greatest healing ministry in this present day and time. And one of the things he said is that, you know, when you're involved in praying for somebody for healing. And there's this kind of life and death struggle going on. He said, you need to realize that it's more like a fight than you probably have ever imagined. And so what we need to realize is that when you're fighting for somebody's life and it's going up and down and up and down, and you're getting discouraged, just think of it like this. 
we're in, think of it like you're in a boxing match and the, the boxing match is scheduled to go 10 rounds and you might hit them and knock them down. Then they pop back up and they hit you and knock you down and it's back and forth. And basically, you know, whoever's going to quit first is going to lose or whoever gets knocked out. And so in a situation like this, we're praying for another person. So it's not that we're personally going to get knocked out, but are we going to quit? And so if you get the mindset, you know, I am literally, I'm in the boxing ring with the devil and whoever gives up first is going to lose. And so, so when that recollection came to mind, I shared it with my dad and then our perseverance was stimulated. Okay. So that was really good. So, so we got some will to fight was reinvigorated inside of us. You know, so just think, you know, it's going 10 rounds. Don't quit. No matter what you do, don't quit. We have promises of God for healing. We have promises of God that when two pray in agreement, it shall be done. We have promises of God. When you lay your hands upon the sick, they shall recover. But when your eyes are seeing contra contradictory information, it can make it, it can make you want to quit or it can make you speak a negative confession, which can lead to failure. So we have a little mental battle going on in addition to fighting directly against the devil. Okay. Then another thing happened in this situation and this was profound. So, you know, I gave my dad some of these little Kenneth Hagin booklets, you know, just to kind of occupy his mind, just to give him something to read. And he was reading, I think it was called the past tense nature of the gospel or, or called something like that. And so after everybody had left the hospital room, you know, he's there, I think it was Sunday night. And every time he would open up this little book to read about the Bible, something would go crazy with the numbers on the machines, oxygen level would go bad. Heart rate would go bad. Um, respiration rate, something would go South, you know, it go, it would go in a negative direction. And then repeatedly, every time he would open up the book to read every time he would pray every time um, he would read a little miracle book. Anytime he did something spiritual, the numbers went haywire for this person. Like they went bad. Okay. Well, my dad told me that this past Monday, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, we're not dealing with just a plain old sickness because sickness doesn't get mad at you. If, if you start to pray sickness, doesn't get mad at you. If you read a spiritual book, sickness doesn't get mad at you for reading about miracles. The only thing that's going to retaliate for you doing something spiritual is a demon. So then we recognize that the situation we're dealing with for this person is not just a sickness, but it's a demon. And so then on Monday, we prayed with a renewed faith because we knew, we knew absolutely what was going on. There was a devil that was oppressing and trying to kill our loved one. Okay. It was the devil. And so we just commanded, you know, in the name of Jesus, commanded this devil to leave in the name of Jesus. We bound that demon in Jesus name. And we will see an example um, actually, I don't think it's in this passage, but, um, there's an example in the Bible where Jesus cast a demon out of somebody out of a boy, and then he commanded it never to enter again. And so we pray like that in the name of Jesus, you know, Satan, you and your demons shall not enter this person again. And so we bound it up and then we prayed, um, you know, there's a promise Psalm 91. There's all kinds of promises in there. No evil shall befall you. And literally that word befall means it shall not encounter you. It shall not come upon you. It shall not touch you. No plague shall come near your dwelling. Well, you dwell in your body. Your body is not you. Your body is your tent. Your body is your dwelling place. We are the spirit and soul inside of this body. So literally, if you, you can believe in the scripture in the way that no plague will come upon your body. Amen. Okay. So, so anyway, we just um, commanded preservation, protection of God be upon this person, untouchability by the devil be upon this person, um, absolute protection from all demons be upon this person. So we pray for healing. We commanded the devil to go. And then we prayed for protection, this preservation protection, which is a promise to God to be upon this person. And then from Monday night onwards, like Monday night, all the numbers were perfectly stable. They were too, they were out of bounds, but they were stable. There was no more of this up and down and up and down and up and down, which makes you think they're about to die, you know? So they were stable. Then all day Tuesday, they got better and they were just rock solid, perfect numbers all day Tuesday. Um, 
Um, t- Tuesday night was wonderful. Wednesday was wonderful. And so everything, boom, just turned around. Once we had the revelation that we're dealing with a demon and prayed in authority against that demon, then boom, everything was set straight. And, and so this person went home from the hospital last night. And so thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes, they are healed and delivered from the suppression of the devil. And also we thank you, Father, for giving us wisdom. We thank you for giving us wisdom about um, the perseverance, you know, the, the boxing match kind of per- concept. And we thank you for giving us wisdom that we were dealing with the demon. Amen. So, so what I want to talk about, I want to go through some, some passages here and talk about this a little bit more. So there's four things I really want to talk about. One is, you know, there's, we have a challenge, you know, when we're in a situation like this, there's a challenge to believe based upon what we see. And so I, I got to experience this sight challenge more so in this situation, because it's not like I'm praying over the phone for somebody on the other side of the, the earth, which is what most of our prayers are because we're all over the place, right? Um, this was face to face with a loved one. Okay. So there's a challenge to belief based on what you're seeing. Then I want to talk some more about this boxing match kind of fight concept. And I want to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, identifying your enemy. And then I want to talk about drawing strength from one another. Okay. So we have this carnal challenge, first of all, and the Bible says in second Corinthians five, seven, where we walk by faith, not by sight. And it says to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, so when we have a situation like this, it's sometimes it's good not to see it because when you see it, then you can see sometimes you're looking at death right in the face and that can be a demotivator. It can cause fear. It can cause doubt. It can do a lot of things. Okay, but you don't always have the option not to see things. And so in this situation, I had to see it, you know, and it was warring against me in a profound way. And so I, we, we have to fight because if we're carnally minded, if we believe what our eyes are seeing, where we see this person, their numbers are completely bad. It seems that they're, they're not responding to prayer um, the way we need them to, like it gets better than worse, you know, um, and it, you know, it's, it's challenging. So if we are going to be carnally minded, if we're going to stare at the numbers on the machine, if we're going to focus on what happens if they die, those things, it's going to lead to death. Okay, so we have to you have a fight to not be wrapped up in what you're seeing and hearing and not just the machines and not just the look of the person, but the doctor and other doubting family members may speak, may be speaking death. So you, you have all this death input coming into you and you can't meditate on that. You have to switch over and be thinking spiritually. And a major component of that is we need to cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And that means that, you know, if the doctor says, well, I'm sorry, but your loved one has X, Y, Z disease. Um, we can make them comfortable or whatever they say, but they're, they're, they're not going to be healed or they're going to be on medicine all the rest of their life or whatever. You know, so doctors are generally, they have bad news to share. And so we need to cast down whatever bad news doctors may share. We need to cast down whatever, doubting opinion another family member may have. We need to cast down whatever words of death the person you're praying for may have. And then the biggest component of this is we need to cast down all this myriad of thoughts in our own mind that are warring against us, you know, because I was doing more casting down of thoughts in my own mind than I was casting down thoughts of what other people were saying. In my own mind, you know, the devil was at war with me in my mind because I was staring what looked like death in the face. And that was a huge thing to, to continually cast down because your imagination starts going, well, what happens if they die? What's going to happen to this and that? And what's going to happen to this other person? You start what ifing all these things. And that's just, you're just, you're meditating on the wrong thing. This is the most frustrating part. And my dad and I were talking about, it. he's like, what do I do? I keep getting these thoughts. I'm like, you know, there's, it is a workout, you know, casting down. It is a workout. When you're in a crisis situation, you may have to cast down like every thought that's in your mind because the devil wants you to be in fear. He wants you to doubt. I mean, this is not fun. It's a fight, but we have to do it. And we just need to have that mindset. 
You must cast down all these thoughts of death and destruction and sickness and non-recovery and being bound to medicine, being bound to oxygen, whatever, whatever thing they're saying, you, you have to go to war and you have to cast down a hundred percent of it. And you can't sit there and meditate. On, don't even meditate on those things for not even a second. Cause the more you meditate on it, it's going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's what we call worry. It results in doubt. It results in defeat. Amen. So this was, this is the hardest part. This carnal aspect. Okay. Then you know, we got a surge of confidence, as I mentioned, when we realize, you know, we, we gain some willingness to fight when we, when this idea of, you know, you're in a 10 round boxing match, don't quit. You're only going to lose if you quit. And so we, we didn't quit. And the Bible tells us we're going to have a fight. You know, now Jesus, he was pretty proficient and worst case scenario for Jesus is he prayed twice for one guy, <laughs> you know, whereas, um, you know, in our case, we haven't fully laid hold of, of his strength, you know, in fullness as he was operating. We need to, we should, we will. Um, so there are times when we have more of a war than just a one prayer, cast the devil out and, you, and you're done. You know, sometimes you have a, a true battle on your hands. And so we need to remember passages like Matthew eleven twelve, 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent Take it by forth, force. The violent take it by force. Okay, so think of it like this. We have all these great and precious promises, you know, kingdom promises. We have kingdom promises like we have authority over the devil. We have kingdom promises that um, we will trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. We have kingdom promises such as of, of healing, of answer prayers, of casting out devils. We have all these kingdom promises. Well, sometimes we have to we have to be in this boxing match for 10 rounds before we get the victory. And um, we need to be spiritually violent. We need to take up our authority. We need to be passionate, uh, fervent. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So we need to be fervent. That means white, hot, passionate. So we need to have this righteous indignation. We need to release that in prayer of authority. Okay. And, and when we do that, we may, we may need to do it several times. You know, it's a fight. Stick in there for the fight. Be violent towards the devil, spiritually violent. Be spiritually violent, exercising your authority, commanding the devil to be gone, commanding healing, commanding the will of God to be done. Be spiritually violent and active in it, and you will have the victory. Amen? And in 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, it says, Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. Okay, now, the devil is, you know, he's like a lion in, in many ways, right? So he is powerful, Okay, he's not as powerful as God, obviously, but he is powerful. You know, he can bring death and destruction and calamity and all kinds of things. So he does have power to do mighty harm. And he's done that his whole career. Right now. But he's also like a lion in that, you know, he's looking for an, an easy victim, even though a lion is powerful. A lion is also looking for an easy opportunity. And so what makes someone an easy target? Well, it could be um, somebody is weak in faith. Somebody doesn't know how to, they don't know the promises of God for healing or authority. Maybe they don't know the mechanism of, of how to pray correctly. They don't know about speaking to the mountain. You know, they don't know how to defend themselves. They may have faith in God, but they don't know how to apply that faith. You know, so there's a multitude of reasons of why someone could be an easy victim. And it, it could also be an easy victim as someone who, when the devil hits you, you, you get scared and, and you quit, you know, like a bully. Bullies like to pick on somebody and they're relying upon that person to be in fear and not fight back. Okay, well, the devil's the same way. You know, so he may, he may produce fear in you that makes you want to quit. Like, you know, there's no way we're going to win in this situation. I'm staring death in the face and, and he'll try and get you to throw in the towel. Okay. No, stand up and fight. You know, so if, if you let him just knock you down with one punch, you're going to lose every time and you're going to be an, an easy victim for the rest of your life. 
He's going to dominate over you. So we have to stand up to the bully. We have to fight against him um, and go 10 rounds. You know, we have to resist him firm in the faith, steadfast in faith. That means immovable from faith and circumstances, words, people say, um, things you see on the monitors, on the heart monitor, on the oxygen monitor, all these things, they're going to be warring against your faith. You have to stand steadfast. I don't care what I see or what I hear by his stripes. This person's healing is paid for. I'm not going to deviate from it. Amen. So that's, that's what we need. We need steadfast faith. We need perseverance. When you stand in the fight, think of it as a fight. You have multiple rounds to go. So don't get discouraged if things go south. They'll turn, they'll go north again. Amen. Okay. Now, um, persistence is a major thing that we need. You know, we, we prefer, obviously, we prefer when we pray for someone one time and it's finished. You know, that's best case uh, scenario. We like that. It's an easy win. It's better for the person who's been suffering. It's better for the people who pray. It's obviously it's better when things happen just boom right away. That's the best case scenario, but it's not always that way. And so we have we need perseverance and persistence when um, these type of situations arise. So Jesus told us in Luke 18, 1 to 8. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. He will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? Okay. So Jesus is teaching us about perseverance, about persistence, about endurance and faith, endurance and prayer. And sometimes we're going to need this, um, some situations will need it. Some situations won't. And it definitely, it's a faith builder. When you go through something like this and you come out the other side, it does raise you up because you won a big battle. Amen. So we don't look forward to these, but we look, we appreciate the outcome. Okay. So we, we were tempted to lose heart in the middle of the situation. And so Jesus says, do not lose heart. Don't <laughs> lose heart. Continue to pray. Okay. And so then he gives an example, you know, a judge who neither fears God nor respects man. So that would be like the devil, the devil, the God of this world, obviously he rebelled against God and he likes to still kill and destroy man. So he has no respect for, for us. Okay. And in this example, this widow kept coming and coming and coming, you know, she was insistent. She was persistent. She wasn't going to back off. She was in the fight. She wasn't going to quit until she got what she wanted. And so then because of this persistence and insistence, um, this unjust judge, a.k.a. the devil, finally threw in the towel and gave in. Okay, so, so if we need to be more persistent than the devil, okay, that's where the victory is. We have to be more persistent than the devil. We have to make up our mind when we enter the fight. We're not going to quit. Uh, we're, we're not going to quit at all. Just th that's our biggest one of our biggest enemies is this desire to quit, you know, because we get discouraged or whatever. We have to fight that desire to quit that may arise. Be persistent. Pray for persistence. Pray for boldness. Pray for courage. Pray for endurance. Pray for these things and let them be strengthened in you. Amen. And by us being more persistent and insistent than the devil, victory occurred. You know, in this case, the devil gave in. He says, because this widow keeps bothering me. And if you give up on the first prayers, if she, she gave up on the first attempt, um, she would lose, right? But she didn't give up. She kept going and going and going. She kept coming and kept coming. She was continually coming. And then he finally gave in. Amen. So it's that same exact thing sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's that same way with the devil. When we're, whether it's healing, whether it's 
praying for finances. It doesn't matter. Sometimes, not always, we'll have a battle as opposed to a one prayer, finished, done deal situation. All right. So be persistent and victory is yours. Go the 10 rounds. Okay. Then I like to hold God accountable to, you know, he, he is accountable to his word. His word are his promises to us. It's his commitment. And so we, we should hold him accountable to what he has said. It's a contract. He's made a contract with us. Here's my contract. This word is my contract to you. Okay, this is what I promised to do for you. And you may have certain requirements you have to fulfill, but he has stated his will. He stated his commitment. And so we need to hold him accountable for what he said in certain situations. Okay. So for example, I like to lean on verse eight. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Okay. I, I don't want to be praying for somebody's healing 10 years, 20 years. Like there's people that you'll find in the church. I've been standing in my standing for my healing for 10 years. I've been standing for my healing for 20 years. I'm standing in faith, waiting for my healing. Okay. That's, that's not good. Okay. We have a promise of speedy justice. Okay. And when I pray, I will, I will throw that in there. I'm like, and Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that we just prayed for healing. And I thank you that it is done speedily for it is written. I tell you, he will give justice speedily. So I thank you for a speedy resolution to this problem that we are praying about right now. Thank you. And amen. And so I, I want to put as much commitment from the word into that prayer as I can. Amen. And then, you know, a week and a half, that's, that's not too bad. That's, that's not too bad. I'd rather it be boom instant, but a week and a half, we can do that. Amen. All right. Then I want to talk about um, faith through knowing your enemy, faith through knowing your enemy. So, so sometimes you need a boost of faith. Like if you had a little more insight into a situation, you might be able to handle it more successfully. So I want to look at, in, in, in particular, what I want to play on is sometimes we have a sickness and sometimes we have a demon. And when we can identify that there's a demon there, I think that will give us a surge of faith and confidence to pray against that situation and get a victory. So some things you want to look for, you know, how do I know if I'm dealing with a demon? So there are some indicators. So if you have something that comes and goes, okay, like, like epilepsy, in the example of this boy, he had epilepsy. Epilepsy is not where you're a hundred percent, you know, in seizures, a hundred percent of the time it comes and goes, you know, it, it, it comes and then you're fine for a long time and then it goes, or I guess I said that wrong. And it, it, the demon comes and then the person they're having seizures or having other issues and then it will go. And then they have a period of time where they seem to be healthy and then it'll come back. And then, so any, anytime there's something that's coming and going, then there's probably it's probably a demon. Like many people with so-called fibromyalgia may say, you know, I'm just fine. Then all of a sudden this pain comes and it leaves and then they're fine. And the pain comes and it leaves, or there's people that are manic depressant. Like they're, they're, they're happy. Then all of a sudden they get extremely depressed and then they're happy. And then they get extremely depressed. That's a coming and going of a demon. Then there's people that, you know, maybe they hear things, they hear voices. And um, what do they call it? Schizophrenia. Um, or they have multiple personalities. That's the coming and going of a demon. Okay, so any look for comings and goings. Uh, if you're dealing with a person, their symptoms are there, then the symptoms leave. That's that's a good possibility. It's not a sickness; it's a demon. And another indicator, you know, I've, <laughs> there's some crazy things that happen. Like somebody ha have a headache, like right here, and you pray for the headache, and it moves from here to here, and then you pray again, it moves from there to here. You pray again, it moves from there to there. And yet, that happens. And sickness doesn't move just by you speaking words. Now you can pray in faith and sickness can be destroyed. You can cause it to disappear, but you don't pray and sickness just all of a sudden bounces from this side of the head to that side of the head, to that side of the head, to that side of the head. Sickness doesn't do that. Um, I had a situation where we prayed for a lady and she had pain. I don't remember exactly. It was other in the back. And then we prayed again, it went to the hip, we prayed it again, it went to the knee, we prayed again, it went to the ankle. And then the next time we prayed, it, it left. And so it, 
Cygnus doesn't migrate. You know, Cygnus may migrate on a slow path, like if it's a bacteria or infection, it may slowly spread through the body, but it doesn't spread upon you saying some words. The only thing that's instantly jumping from place to place to place in a person's body is a devil. He's touching you here, then there, then there, then there, then there. Okay, that, that's, that tells you right there you're dealing with the demon. Okay, So think about those things that I just said, and, and if you can identify those you know, any of those characteristics and somebody you're, you're ministering to, then maybe you want to change your tactic to just wholeheartedly come against a demon. Amen. So here we'll look at a couple examples. So in Matthew 17, 15, 18, Lord have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Okay, so well, we know about epilepsy, and we know that as we just spoke, epilepsy comes and goes. Seizures comes, uh, come and they go. And so when that when this demon would come upon this boy, it would try and kill him. You know, it would try and throw him into the fire. It would try and throw him into the water. But this isn't a 100% on situation. You know, like sickness is always there. An injury is constantly there. But a demon is the only thing that comes and goes. Right? And so that's what we see in the situation, that it's a demonic situation because it's a coming and going. And, and then... And then also the devil likes to time things in, in a way to produce doubt. I, I guarantee you, he says, um, you know, I took my, so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And it's not written in the Bible, but I promise you what happened. Uh, I'm like 90% sure that what happened is when the disciples went to pray for this boy, the devil threw him into a seizure. Because then, then what happens? He'll get you to be carnally minded. Because you're looking at somebody flopping around on the ground like a fish, foaming at the mouth, eyes rolling back in their head, and you think they're going to die. And so guess what? You have just exited from faith. You are faithless and perverse, you know, and the devil purposefully does that. He purposefully, if you go to minister to somebody, will try and bring on a seizure in that moment to cause you to doubt. And that happened one time when we went to go pray for this poor girl had a drug overdose and she was in a coma for a month. And, and so they, they, uh, the day before I came to pray, they, um, they had to like tie her to the bed, like literally her arm was tied to one corner, this arm to the other corner, her feet were tied to the corners of the hospital bed. Like she was bound up tight because she started having seizures. And so, you know, I went to the hospital room and this girl, she's flopping around like a fish, um, salivating, her eyes are rolling back in her head, she, you know, making all kinds of crazy noises. The mom is screaming and yelling. The daughter's, you know, looks like she's going to die. And that was, it's not an accident. The devil knew that I had an appointment to go on Saturday to pray for this girl. So on Friday, she started having seizures. So when I went there, she's flopping around like a fish. And I'm having this carly minded challenge because of what I'm seeing. And so we prayed and then we went downstairs. We separated ourselves. From looking at it and we prayed again not looking at the situation and the next day she woke up from the coma amen so i'm i promise you what happened with his disciples is the boy had a seizure in front of the, the disciples and they doubted okay so jesus was stronger than that jesus went ahead and ministered and he rebuked the demon okay and it's, it, when we think about how to pray it often says jesus rebuked the fever he rebuked the demon he rebuked the sickness with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth. So when it says how Jesus prayed, he wasn't meek and mild and timid, but he was bold and authoritative. And so we want to take that same bold and authoritative um, mannerism into our prayer. And, um, and that's uncomfortable for many people to do. But if you're uncomfortable, maybe you're not even in faith anyway, because you're too worried about other people and the situation than worried about doing what you need to do to be effective. I personally find I'm a lot more effective if I put some, some intensity, some volume, some passion, and I'm fervent when I pray. 
And when it describes how Jesus prayed, he's, he's doing things in a fervent manner. Okay, so be fervent when you're praying. Hey, Bobby. Okay, so he, yes. I'm sorry. I remember when you told us that you went into the hospital and you were kind of quiet because you were in an ICU unit. So you were kind of quiet. And the lady actually stopped you and said, Bobby, that's not you. Pray like you want to pray. And then you said after that, you just never had an issue with it again. Right. So then I just had to get courage and not worry. See, we have fear of man. What are the nurses going to think? What are the doctors going to think? What are the other patients going to think? What are the people walking in the hallway going to think? I don't want to make a show. I don't want to make a scene. You know, all those thoughts are going through your head. But then when I just set that aside and just let it rip, then boom, that pain left this girl. Amen. So yeah. be bold. I, I love that. Love that. Thank you. Amen. We need boldness. Okay. Let's look at one more example. So in Acts 16 or 16 to 18. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Okay, now the reason I wanted to put this particular passage. So here we have a demon. So there's a spirit of divination that's in this girl. And this particular demon was responding to spiritual matters. Okay, so which is somewhat related to the situation my dad and I were dealing with where he would start reading the, you know, reading about the Bible or reading a miracle book or praying. So every time he did something spiritual, the demon would act up and the symptoms and the machines would go crazy. Okay. Because the devil would, would get pissed. He would get angry that my dad was trying to do something spiritual and he would retaliate by attacking this person. Okay. Well, what's happening here? So Paul, he's out preaching and teaching and healing and, and doing, he's out, proclaiming the gospel. And so this spirit is responding to his faith actions and is harassing them. And this girl who's got this evil spirit is following them around and crying out constantly. These men are the servants. I mean, she wasn't saying a bad thing, but she was annoying them. You know, so the devil was aggravated and causing problems because of Paul's spiritual activity. So we see a spirit is responding to Paul's spiritual activity to bring harassment. Okay, and in the case that my dad and I were dealing with, every time he started to do something spiritual, that demon that was causing the sickness would bring a, an extra dose of harassment, like instantly, more harassment, pray some more, more harassment, read the book, more harassment. And so it was a, it was responding, it was responding in a contra, in a, in a negative direction to any application of faith on the part of my dad. Okay, only a demon will do that. Sicknesses don't do that. And, and so what we're trying to do here is we want to try and identify the enemy. You know, if there's a demon, if you've been praying for something and you're not getting the results you want, maybe try and get a little more insight. And that little bit of insight for us was game changing. I mean, it was like phenomenal. Amen. Okay. Then the last thing, let me just check the time. All right. So I guess we're not going to do Colossians uh, chapter two today, but said so this will just be testimony and teaching today. Um, the last thing I want to point out is it's good to have somebody to edify you when you're in a crisis situation. And um, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as long as you are doing. Okay, so it's really weird you know, because when you're in this situation, it's tempting to start entertaining those thoughts of death. It's tempting to start believing what your eyes are seeing. And, and if you have somebody by your side, then even though you're, you're feeling like you might start doubting and you're, you're almost about to throw in the towel, then my dad would come and ask me some questions. He's like, I don't understand you know, what's going on. Why, why, why is this not going in the right direction? Why every time I do this, this happens. And so then that 
forces me to give a faith response when he asks a question. And so I have to like come out of the, the doubt that I was about to enter into and then speak faith to him. And then, so, so I would encourage him and he would encourage me. I would encourage him and he would encourage me. And so this mutual encouragement forces you out of that doubtful inclination and it causes you to help one another because I might've thrown in the towel. If he wasn't trying to draw strength from me, I might've been inclined to throw the towel in. And, and, but I didn't. So thankfully he was asking me questions. So I was able to like draw upon things that I know and share them. And that pulled me out of this doubtful spot into a place of faith as well. So, and it works both directions. And it, if you have somebody there with you, it'll help. It will help each of you to not enter into doubt. It will help each of you try and encourage the other one, pull up scripture, talk about it, pull up testimonies, talk about it. And then that will help keep you away from doubt. And so that was another key thing that was necessary uh, in this situation that we were facing. Amen. All right. So I hope that this was helpful. Um, I know that I feel, I feel really good right now. <laughs> I feel much stronger than I did a week and a half ago. I'm very happy about where we are in this situation at this present time. This person is at home, no IVs, none of that stuff. I mean, it was totally miraculous when we knew it was a devil and we came against that devil. Boom, victory. Okay, so now we just need to, you know, stay in faith, stay the course. Victory is ours. Amen.